Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. So one piece of feedback that we routinely get at Braver Angels after our programming goes essentially like this. One, the media is terrible. Or two, the media is dividing us. It's no secret that our media is more fragmented that, than ever, that people live in their own filter bubbles, that we no longer have the vaunted shared reality that people want. But we're also searching for solutions, and we're not sure exactly where to go. There are a number of organizations that are trying to solve this problem that are trying to help people become more literate in the news, to help people sort fact from fiction, and to help people digest the news from both the left and the right so that they can have a more complete, nuanced, and hopefully empathetic understanding of our politics and society. So I wanted to bring on a couple guests who are leading, in my view, particularly innovative and promising solutions to this problem. And we'll get into the causes and consequences of media polarization, and then talk a little bit about their organizations, which I think are a cause for excitement and for hope. And one that Braver Angels is really excited about as we try to do this work on the ground, and again, constantly run into the issue of people criticizing the media. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our two discussants, and then we can dive right in. So firstly, we have John Gable. He is the co-founder and CEO of All Sides, an organization whose mission is to free people from filter bubbles so they can better understand the world and each other. At allsides.com, you will find daily news and issues from all perspectives, left, center, right, and everything in between to provide a fuller picture of what is really going on. We also have Nathaniel Barling. He is the co-founder and CEO of Nowhere, Nowhere is a news organization dedicated to establishing the facts as they are on the global, national, and local stories that matter, integrating machine learning deeply into their newsroom in order to surmount the business model challenges that have driven the news media toward hyper-partisanship. So John, I'll, th I'll start with you. Can you tell me a little bit more about your mission and expand a little bit on what All Sides is trying to accomplish? Yeah, we really, first of all, great being here. I appreciate you doing this. Um, we really started more from the technology side. I'm a Netscape. Um, I used to be the product manager, lead product manager for Netscape Navigator. For the younger people in the audience, that was the first popular web browser um, when the internet was young. And we were very concerned. Um, I, I gave a speech over 20 years ago, which is disturbing to say. Um, where we, 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 we were, the whole idea of the internet was we'd all be connected. We'd get great access to great information and we'd be able to connect with each other and, and learn uh, about each other directly and understand each other for who we are as individuals. And that's what we love. That's what woke us up and had us working seven days a week over weekends, late nights. But I was concerned 23 years ago now that the internet might also train us to discriminate against each other in new ways. I was concerned that because of the overwhelming information and because of the way you get information online that we'd start thinking stereotypes, that we discriminate against each other. We, we, there was a negative side to it as well. And it's gotten a lot worse than I ever imagined in ways I thought and ways I'd never imagined. Um, that also hits business models and other things that really break us apart and actually have us less informed. We know one point mm. of view really, really well. One point of view so many times that we are, confidently ignorant <laughs> because we know one side 800 times and don't know the full picture even once. And so we started all sides eight years ago to solve the problem of the internet, of the information flow and relationship flow online of the internet. And that accidentally got us to the area that's most problematic in terms of information flow online, which is news media. But we actually have a much broader view of the problem. And um, we, we do believe that the flow of information and the flow of relationships online using that technology in its current state, because it changes, um, that that is what's been driving 
the great growth in polarization division in society. We, we think it's kind of like a, you, you think of the printing press and we think of reformation, the enlightenment, that changed society. The internet is that big of a change. And we think of the printing press as this wonderful thing that led to reformation, but we forget that in the first hundred years or so, once they started creating smaller books you can transport, there was great societal chaos. People were printing, it was, it was insane. They were, they were printing things that were completely false, a lot of false information. There was a lot of pornography, sounds like the internet. And they were even concerned that people would like keep their heads down looking at their books and not interact with each other. You could just imagine all the people with their phones today. <laughs> That's what happened then. And for the first 100 years, it was utter chaos. But after a while, two things happened. Individuals learned how to use this new technology. They learned not to believe everything they read. If they read something that, that challenged authority and made them mad, they didn't go out and, and throw rocks or riots, which is what happened back then. They, they, they understood the technology a little bit better. We also created new technology, um, libraries and credible publishers. So you could identify the more credible information versus the less credible information. I believe we're in that early stage where we're in the chaotic stage, um, where everything's kind of messed up. And I just want us to get to that new enlightenment, if you will, in less than 100 years. Let's get down to 15, 20, 25 years, as opposed to 100, because the pain that individuals go through during this time of chaos and change is horrible. And let's get through there. Let's get to the better place sooner rather than later. Totally. Well, that's, yeah, fascinating historical context. And I had never thought of it that way. And I think it's important to look back at history as we're thinking about the present and the future. So Nat, I know Nowhere is, is relatively young and you guys are one of the only, or at least one of the leading organizations that's really leaning into what I hear a lot of people talk about as the technology of the future, AI and machine learning. So talk to us a little bit about Nowhere, sort of the, the founding of it, where it came from, where it is and where you hope to go. Absolutely, my my pleasure. Thanks so much for for having us on, Kieran. Um, the you know I actually wanted to come briefly to something that that John just mentioned, um, as I think it leads nicely into our story, which is that of of Gutenberg's printing press, um, and uh, you know the 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 radical um, innovation that that was for the way we consume information generally, as John has, has rightly pointed out. Um, uh, you know my view is and our view as a company is that uh, we need a similar a similarly radical innovation uh, in the practice of journalism itself um, and we need to build a new type of news organization that embraces these technologies for good rather than in an effort to divide us via recommendation feeds um, and so uh, you know we at nowhere were, were founded um, to set out uh, and build a news organization that could maintain its commitment and would strive in an ever greater fashion uh, towards those, those principles, those traditional journalistic principles of objectivity uh, and rigor in our journalism. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have remained absolutely committed to that. Um, and we believe that machine learning has a critical role to play in that. Why? Um, again, picking up on a, a similar theme to one that John has been talking about already. Um, there is too much information out there. We as humans simply can't compute it all on our own. Um, uh, any one story of the day, uh, there might be 50, 100, 1,000 pieces of commentary on that particular piece of information that form the whole body of knowledge we have on a particular story that is evolving that is shaping our country or um you know our global community um and so i think uh you know the way we think about machine learning is as a tool that can be used to help us understand that vast array of information that is moving at incredible speed that without which we as a human newsroom cannot keep pace with um, we believe it's critical to use these technologies uh, in order to actually go through our journalistic process um, to integrate this into our sourcing, to integrate this into the way in which we review different perspectives on a story when we're choosing actually how to articulate ourselves. Um, and so 
when I say deeply embedded into our newsroom, you know, the machine learning technologies we have built to cluster information around a particular story, uh, to evaluate in a predictive fashion what we think is reliable, critical information, what we think is perspective from one side or another, um, all of that feeds directly into our own content management system. Yeah, the, you know, the actual piece of software we use uh, to go ahead and write our stories and source our material. Um, and from there, uh, you know, we have set ourselves out with a, with a mandate uh, to deliver the news um, on the top stories of the day, both, both nationally and also locally in our first bureau down in the Treasure Coast, uh, in Florida's Treasure Coast, our first local bureau, um, uh, in a fashion that can be universally trusted. Um, that, that we, the, the readers can trust us to be agendaless and to have delivered the facts as close as we possibly can to what they are. Objectivity, um, there's a huge debate around that, obviously, in, in American media at the moment. Um, we believe, even though it's unattainable, we must continue to pursue it at every turn without a shared reality. And, you know, make no mistake, the news media is the chief creator of our shared reality of the world we see beyond our immediate horizons. Um, without that, we have no foundation for constructive democratic discourse. Um, and so it is that foundation that we're seeking to provide. Um, and we think a news organization has to be built from the ground up in order to do it um, and needs to do it with, with technologies that enable us to be hyper aware and hyper efficient in our reporting so we can get over those hurdles that so many legacy news media organizations and even um, you know the digital media organizations of the last 10 15 years uh, still struggle with a, a fundamental lack of change in the production efficiency of the work that they do in order to keep pace with the change in the efficiency of costs in distributing information and when you when you you know gutenberg's um uh, gutenberg's printing press was both a radical innovation in the production of written media and it was also a radical innovation uh, that enabled massive distribution now the internet has been utilized to drive massive change in distribution in the piece of how we how we can get things out to people it has not been used uh, to actually leverage the power of all of that knowledge we have on the internet to change our production process. So that's where we're kind of, we're moving one step back from the distribution piece and saying, well, we need to, we need to radically innovate on the production piece in order to keep in line and keep our business model in sync such that we can continue providing uh, news of value that provides a foundation. Hmm. Well, one quick follow-up that that uh, brings to mind for me and then John, I'll go over to you because I think this question is relevant to all sides as well. Um, but how do you evaluate objectivity? How does your algorithm uh, develop metrics for objectivity? Do you give uh, different rankings to different sources? I mean, at a certain point, how do you account for the subjective element? I'm, I'm very curious, you know, without getting too deep in the hood, can you just right. talk a little bit more about what that actually looks like in practice? Yes, yeah. we totally can. And Nat and I both can do that. And, um, and I want to follow up on Nat's point about production. Um, so right now, the technology is being used on the production side a little bit in like Wikipedia would be an example. That's when we used a online and, and that gets it's kind of a open source or a crowd wisdom, which is different than crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing was the first attempt to use technology, get lots of ideas together, but it became ugly and a mess and, and only the angry people were heard. Um, there are two different models that kind of run the internet, um, in my mind, in terms of a lot of the production of, of news um, or information. One is kind of the football or soccer stadium model, where the only person you notice is the nudist on the 50-yard line screaming obscenities. It's kind of like the Twitter model. You know, that's how you're heard, is you're just obscene right. and horrible. And then there's kind of the conspirators model. That's what you see on Facebook a lot, where you have all these people who are just alike talking to each other and telling you and getting all riled up about how evil the other people are. There's this great cartoon with, you know, some cats um, sitting around in a lectern and they're talking to each other and they're saying, we are, our, our food has been uh, eaten and our beds have been sullied and blah, blah, blah. 
we must take, bring the war on terrier when they're referring to a terrier dog. And there's this little tiny terrier dog in the corner terrified that what the cats are going to do to it. It's kind of, that's kind of the Facebook model and a lot of other community models where you just have people of the same um, point of view all seeing the world through one view and they get really angry about everybody else. And those are the two things that the internet's producing right now um, in social media. It's not just about news media. It's not just about that. It's all information flow. And there are things like Wikipedia where they come up with a system to try to get better information together. And it's good, but it's not fast enough for the news cycle. Mm. And so what we actually at All Sides about eight years ago, we started experimenting with different ways of working on the production as Nat refers to. And we found that was too slow. What we could do was do something different than Google. Google basically decides what you should read based on what's most popular in a way. I mean, it's, it's a more sophisticated than a pure popularity, but that's essentially what the relevancy algorithm is about at the end of the day. Mm. And that's great for mob mentality. That's great for witch trials. It's not very good for democracy. Um, at one point, the CEO at Google said that their ideal was that they could give you one answer on a Google search because they knew what you wanted. And that's great if I'm trying to figure out where to get my fast food fix. It's not very good for deliberative democracy. In fact, it's the worst thing possible for a deliberative democracy. So our approach has been to not come up with the right answer, but to use all the information there to enable people to decide for themselves. Hmm. So you'll see recently there was a resignation letter by um, Bari at the New York Times who right. left because they were so, she describes them as being kind of the elite that decides the way the world should be and, and their job is to tell other people the way the world is. And I don't think that's a role of journalism. I don't think that's the role of the internet. The internet was about to was all about empowering individuals, not institutions, but individuals to know better, to understand each other better, to make better decisions, and to ultimately have a better society as a result. So right. for the technology at all sites, that's what we've been focused on. And we do that by making it very easy to see the different perspectives and summarize, sometimes summarizing them. We're using some AI as well and different testing it as ways to be more mm -hmm. efficient about it, to search automatically in a balanced way by using our technologies to identify left, center, right perspectives. And we still have little human beings interacting with that as well. But that's what we're right. so, work towards. So you're saying at all sides, you're really sort of broadening the exposure that people get, specific, especially to views that don't conform to what they normally read or conform to their confirmation bias. But Nat, Precisely. to bring back my, my question to you, uh, I was specifically asking, I'm just fascinated by the idea of AI and machine learning and how does that over time get better and better at deciding what is objective and quicker and quicker and doing it in a way where a certain, uh, you know, subjective switch doesn't take the model all, you know, out of whack. Sure, sure. So I think the, the, the most important thing is that it doesn't. It does not decide what's objective. Um, mm. Uh, that is, I think, the, 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 the most important thing to understand. What it can help us do is it can help us do, it can help us analyze and see what the different perspectives, what the different ways in which people are shaping a narrative are. Um, and it can help us, you know, see through word choice, through structural elements, what are the signals that would suggest that this is a, uh, you know, uh, we can, in some cases, we, we, we can do this where it says, what are the word signals and the structural elements in the story um, based on the knowledge we have of every story our system has ever read that would suggest an Israeli-leaning stance on, on, on the Israel-Palestinian conflict versus mm. a Palestinian-leaning stance on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And, you know, it's not the, the machine learning's job to say, well, th this is what the objective take then looks like. It's, it's to give us that perspective when we're actually going through our reporting process. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the kind of interesting corollaries to, to uh, what John is talking about from the consumer perspective is we really think about that information as coming into the newsroom and changing the flow of information that's coming into the newsroom so that we as an organization are better able to articulate what the facts really are and try and try and describe them and communicate them to our readers in a fashion that can be trusted no matter the the value set you place on top of that information and the ways in which you interpret it 
Um, and it's that that I believe, uh, you know, the leading news organizations in, in the US have, have, have moved away from um, to the detriment of our democracy. Um, and so it's a, you know, I think, yeah, the, the most important point is that it doesn't determine what's objective. Um, it is our job as a newsroom to take that broader set of information, that broader set of perspective on a story, the broader set of background and context on a story that our machine learning is helping gather um, and use that to articulate ourselves in a more objective fashion. Um, really think, you know, one of the ways I think about it is, is about turbocharging our, our, our efforts to understand the world as a newsroom. Um, and, you know, one of the ways in which we think that's absolutely critical is, um, you know, we have a limited set of perspectives in the newsroom. There's just no, the, 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 there's no two ways about it. Um, we have a small group of full-time editorial staff. We've got uh, about 10 editorial, uh, full-time editorial staff, uh, reporters and editors. Um, and uh, from, uh, you know, with only 10 folks, it's impossible to get over just those 10 sets of biases, right? And so right. We're, trying to, we're trying to help our own newsroom get over the sets of biases we have in looking at the information we use uh, to report. And from there, uh, one of the really interesting things we're able to do is when we actually produce a story, when we actually publish, we're able to then compare our outputs and where our outputs sit within our models to, alter to, to, to the alternative pieces of coverage that are out there. So we're able to kind of hold ourselves accountable to mm. have, we, have we actually done anything different to, to, to what other people are providing out there? Have we actually given things in a structurally a more accurate, um, a less hyper, you know, a less partisan, a less hyperbolic um, delivery of the facts. Right. And so, John, when you are presenting the full spectrum of news or the news of the day from left to right, how do you determine what is a faithful representation of what the quote unquote left is saying and what the quote unquote right is saying? Because on the right, you know, you have the Wall Street Journal but then you also have Breitbart and Newsmax and the Daily Caller and the sort of spectrum within the right. And then on the left, you know, you have the New York Times, but you also have the Huffington Post. So do you essentially, you know, come up with a, a spectrum where you're creating rankings based on the ideological polarity? How do you kind of approach that issue? Because there's such a spectrum on, on both sides when it comes to ideology and also, frankly, when it comes to uh, respect for basic facts. Yeah, exactly. And you described it well. We actually have a patented process we've experimented with and done to identify that. So what we do is, is kind of a shortcut to what Nat's talking about, because he's using technology, we're using technology to bring news into the room. Um, we basically have a way, essentially bias is completely um, subjective. What people think is left or center or right is subjective. And even though we do very thorough bias ratings, we have a blind bias system where we actually recruit a bunch of people across the political spectrum themselves and across the economic spectrum themselves. And they read news articles and headlines without knowing who wrote it. So they see headlines hmm. from New York Times, Huffington Post, and Wall Street Journal, and Fox, and everybody else without knowing who wrote it. And then they give their, their feeling about how that source, after seeing lots of articles and headlines from that one source, whether they're leaning left, center, right, or what have you. And so they get this kind of blind review of it. And we make sure we have a lot of variety of people looking at it. And then we can basically do a normalized average of that, if you will, to get a sense that this source is on one end of the spectrum while this source is on the other end of the spectrum. But as you dig into it, you realize it's not linear. It's not left and right. There's also authoritarian versus libertarian. Right. And also right. a lot more than that, religious and traditional and, and other kinds of spectrums. What you really want to do ultimately for the math geeks out there is you do kind of a cluster analysis and find clusters of opinion. Uh, imagine a three-dimensional space where you have a lot of people kind of similar to each other in this area and other ideas similar to this area. And then you get really crazy math and you have N dimensions and all that stuff. But essentially, at the end of the day, um, we, we, we present it very cleanly to look left, center, right. But we're actually looking at the different clusters of opinion, the different clusters of perspectives on something. And we try to do our best to reveal the best presentation of each one of those different perspectives every time.
the dominant the dominant cluster is it was that would that be the right way to describe it john yeah i think the, the math geeks would appreciate that essentially so yeah. you have like a few clusters that represent ideas or spectrums of ideas and we try to represent all of those in general just doing the left center right is good but frankly we're looking for more um frequently right. there are differences on the right or the left and our team we actually go um, a, we use technologies just like Nat's doing. I think Nat and I should like either we're related, don't know it, or we're going to get married one day in the future because <laughs> he and I are so on the same page here. Um, but we also hire our team and share their political biases on our site. So we have on our team itself people from the far left, far right, and everything in between, mm. in addition mm. to our technology guaranteeing that as kind of a double, a triple check. And nothing we write that's original doesn't go through people on opposite sides of spectrum reviewing it. So there are a lot of right, processes right. we go through. And, and I, lo I love the idea of almost like the taste test. Um, and this begs the question as a follow-up to you, John, and then I'll let you, Nat, sort of answer it as well. But you kind of spoke about the, the ideological polarity and creating this you know, sophisticated matrix to sort through that. But what about when it comes to the actual accuracy of mm. things? Because that's a different matrix. And I think sometimes, people think, okay, oh, if the, the right is saying this and the left is saying this and they're kind of equally weighted, then the truth must be somewhere in the middle. Where at the end of the day, there also are a, more objective measures of science and basic accuracy and fact checking. How do you sort of sort through that? Because that's not quite the same as the ideological representation. That's absolutely true. And one good thing about having so many people talking so much online. Um, th there's been more content created online in the last 24 hours than there was in the history of the planet before the year 2000. And so by being able to sort and curate that, if there's something that's out there that's false, there's somebody else out there saying it's false and giving you the data about it being false. So we mm -hmm. show both of those. So rather than trying to create some kind of omniscient technology that knows it's accurate or what's not we simply have somebody saying the thing that's that's false and if it's if it's accepted enough if people talk about enough that it's heard that it's breaking through the noise then there are other people out there saying well this is it's false and this is how it's false mm -hmm. so we give people the ability to discern that themselves now there are lots of false things that aren't heard about that much and that's great we don't give noise to those but if there's something that's completely outlandish that's really getting heard, not only do you, it would be a mistake to hide it because it's being heard anyway. And so mm. what you want to do is have that false information that everybody's hearing published next to the information that says, this is how it's false, this is how it's wrong. So people know because a lie that's not combated lives on. Right, so, so like a tweet, a tweet by President Trump that may be factually dubious, you're saying, it doesn't make sense to hide it because everyone's going to see it, but you want to sort of pair it with uh, information that kind of uh, rigorously questions and demonstrates the areas in which it might be Precisely. False. And it's and, not and only so, tweets from politicians on both sides, but it's also the press sometimes get it wrong where they believe their own narrative. And then you need to get that out there as well. So getting those different perspectives, you want a battle of ideas and you want that battle of ideas to be public and you want it to be easy to follow. And we don't want to be the arbitrators of truth, arbiters of truth. We want to let, the, let it win out. Right. And so, Nat, same question to you. I mean, you mentioned the, the importance of language and certain phrases or framing that would sort of trigger an assumption of ideological bias. Do you take sort of a similar approach when it comes to accuracy? Are there certain, uh, you know, hyperbolic phrasings or something that might be a flag to your team of, okay, this we might want to look into and see if it's actually true. Yeah, certainly hyperbole and, and tone are something that can inform that. Um, but our, 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 our reliability models, our accuracy models actually work in, in a different way. And we have, you know, and, and the first thing I'll flag is we have both our, you know, our predictive mechanisms for trying to ascertain whether a piece of information is reliable or not. But then we also have our human editorial team. And mm. it's our, it, it, it is always our reporting team and our editor's job uh, to check those, to actually go through the fact-checking process. We essentially, um, you know, uh, we essentially draft a fact-check on each piece of material, each claim that we see within 
the full source set of information. Um, and we make a prediction as to do we think this is critical information? Do we think it's reliable or not? Um, and how do we think the different references to it stack up in terms of uh, degree of accuracy? And you know, an area where this is really interesting is in things like death statistics. Uh, it, it's been very relevant in, in, in during the pandemic. Um, uh, is looking for cross corroborations, and uh, you know, we we essentially have a model that is able to determine um, uh, on the basis of the language itself, even if the language does not, even if you're not using the same words, is able to determine on the basis of the concepts that are being utilized in a claim. A, a sort of knowledge web, a knowledge graph across all of the different sources, sources of material we have. Um, and then is able to say what we think this point is absolutely central and highly likely to be accurate because it's been cited across this range of sources. And then mm. we were, we're also able to see that what we, we think there are, there's this other point that is less, uh, less critical to the story uh, and is being invoked by a certain set of questionable sources where we need to make it, where we need to take a double take. Um, and so, um, you know, that model is uh, really driven by a corroboration model. But look, any corroboration model is a potential circular reference. If you've got, right. um, you know, if you've, <laughs> if, if the lie breaks out and nobody's questioning it, you're going to see the lie coming through as, as, as claimed to be reliable. And so that's why it's so important that we have the, the nuance and the insight of an experienced editorial team that uh, is able to sniff out um, you know, those things that, that just don't feel right from a journalistic standpoint. And well, actually, I think I saw something that was, you know, or I heard something from a press secretary that was a little different on that front. So I'm gonna dive in deeper there. And the beauty of what our, you know, of, of, of part of the beauty of those machine learning tools is it frees up our editorial resources to actually spend the time on those questions. Um, right. Instead of spending time in the weeds of aggregating sources, of comparing different pieces of material across sources, um, so on and so forth, it enables us to spend the time on actually focusing on the language, focusing on the accuracy questions, um, uh, you know, to publish the best reporting we can. Um, right. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think the, the capacity issue is very interesting. I mean, I guess... The idea is that a, a three-person newsroom in a news desert with nowhere's technology might be able to accomplish what a 10-person uh, newsroom without might accomplish. I mean, I imagine there are questions there when it comes to, you know, deeper, more investigative journalism. But I imagine when it comes to, you know, local stories of interest, it, it's fairly easy to pull from court records and sports scores and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I think that is just, a, you know, it's actually more, it's even more extreme than that. And, and the, we look at the at our bureau in the Treasure Coast, um, where we, we launched there seven months ago. It's our first, it, it was our first experiment really with um, uh, can this technology that we built from the outset to be as generalizable as possible, um, can this work not just on the national news stories that uh, we have hundreds or thousands of, of, of pieces of source material on both primary and secondary. Can this work in an area where there are no media sources? Right. And our sources of information are all primary um, uh, and are structured in a very different format to the way secondary sources are structured. Um, can we utilize this technology to report, um, you know, to a very high caliber in an efficient manner? And what we found is that our, uh, our three-person team in the Treasure Coast, uh, Marine, John, and Nicole, um, uh, the, you know, they are able to produce as much reporting, original reporting a day, as the Palm Beach Post just south uh, is able to produce with around 60 editorial staff. Wow. So it's actually, so it's actually you know, it, 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 it really changes the, the dynamic. And you're absolutely right to point out the question of, of investigative reporting. Um, and, you know, we currently spend less time on that with the resources we have. Uh, but certainly, as I think about being a, you know, a 10 person bureau in the Treasure Coast, um, uh, you know, half of our editorial staff will be able to spend their entire time on investigative stories. Um, mm. And so I think there's, a, um, uh, there's still an efficiency, uh, you know, an efficiency gain that opens up that bandwidth for the reporting team to, to dive into the questions and the stories that 
need unearthing um, because there may no maybe no information, no signals out there on the web yet. Um, uh, and so it's a you know it, it has both an impact on the everyday reporting and in opening up capacity. Certainly, as we think about as we grow for those 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 deeper investigative efforts. Right. Well, I think that's very exciting because I think the dearth of local news coverage and the expansion of these news deserts has been a key factor in the loss of trust that people have in media. And they end up just, you know, spending their time reading national politics, which are far more polarized and <laughs> far more depressing often than actual news that matters to them that's actionable and, and trusted. Uh, and, um, default, and defaulting to the national conversation when it comes to local democratic questions. And, and, exactly. And that's a, that's a, there's, a, there's some amazing data around that from 2000 to 2016, where you saw um, uh, around a third of counties across the United States lost a newspaper, um, but in, in those mm -hmm. 50 in those 15 years. And the the shift, you had around 40 percent of local county and uh, you know district level elections uh, that fell differently on how that community voted in the presidential and in federal elections to how they voted in their local elections, fell across different party lines. And by 2016, that number was nearly zero. And mm -hmm. so you, 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 know, you see the impact and when, when we remove those local watchdogs, when we remove that local conversation, and, and, that, you know, and we're only having it at the national level, um, uh, you know, we're, we, we start to lose sight of actually the things that matter on the ground to people. And you know, I think this is when we look at the large newsrooms in the US today, the Times, the Post, the Journal. Um, uh, it's one of their critical failures and it's, why one of the, it's one of the reasons why it's TV stations and oftentimes TV stations from uh, you know, across different political lines have taken over that mantle. Um, uh, and you know, it's a different type of reporting broadcast journalism and um, uh, it's it's not one that can get necessarily into the weeds and the depth in the same way that the, the written word can um, in a newspaper. Right. So, so it's certainly part of, we certainly see it as a critical part of the story of partisanship in the country, the, the deepening of partisan lines, especially between the coasts and the heart of America. Um, and it's also something that, the you know, plays a, um, uh, plays a critical role in ensuring the effective democratic function at the local level and 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 uh, yeah so so that was that's all to say that this is a local is i believe as important a part of the story as uh, the question of bias in the in the in the national marquee media absolutely well yeah it'll be exciting to see how it goes as as you expand um well since we only have about you know 10 15 minutes left i wanted to shift the conversation a little bit so John, you just mentioned this resignation letter uh, that Barry Weiss of the New York Times published in which he essentially argued that the New York Times was becoming much more ideologically rigid, that she was being bullied, that quote unquote centrist voices are no longer welcome at the Times. And her critique uh, fits into this larger critique that you see of you know, quote unquote cancel culture of you know, small group of elites who lean left essentially establishing what orthodoxy is. And if you deviate from orthodoxy, you will be punished. You also saw that open letter in Harper's calling for a spirit of free inquiry and, and open debate and, and criticizing uh, you know, cancel culture as well. And yet on the left, uh, you have people who say, well, no, I actually think you're conflating being canceled with being criticized. And, you know, if you voice an opinion on Twitter and people don't like it and they call you nasty names and they shame you, uh, you're not canceled. And in fact, ironically, a lot of these people who've been quote unquote canceled have actually expanded their platforms. I mean, you know, Joe Rogan happens to be the most popular podcast in America. On the other side of that, of course, if it goes beyond criticism and your actual job becomes threatened, and if someone says, you know, your tweet made me feel unsafe and you've created a hostile work environment and then you get fired, uh, then I understand uh, a lot more where people are coming from. So it's a complicated issue. And I think that obviously the wraparound issue here is the platforms themselves, uh, which are run by companies that are making money off of conflict and <laughs> human misery, essentially. And at the same time, you have, you know, people of color, and, and marginalized communities that have actually been canceled for hundreds of years 
suddenly have a seat at the table um, and are sort of exerting their own force and trying to exert the reins of authority uh, to, you know, enforce their own objectives. So that was a bit of a rambled context, but I think it's very fascinating and it's become such a polarized issue where you sort of have to be on one side or the other. So John, I want to start with you, both personally and professionally, as you think about all sides. How are you thinking about this issue and how can we actually find maybe some, some common ground and a way to move forward uh, where we're not just being complete assholes to each other? So spe specific about the cancel culture, um, recognize this has happened in America and throughout time before, but McCarthyism was another kind of cancel culture. If you smelled of communism or if you ever thought it was okay for the government to pay for something it shouldn't pay for, you were labeled a communist and then there was this society on the right in that time trying to cancel you out and get you thrown out of jobs. Um, an old friend of mine um, years ago um, who was at Netscape and led Mozilla an open source uh, browser, he actually lost his job when it turned out that he gave $1,000 to a political um, campaign that was very anti the progressive movement there. Um, right. So that's it's been happening. It's getting worse. And what's interesting is that there's left and progressive. A lot of um, there's liberal and progressive. Your traditional liberals want um, conversation. They believe in free speech. It should be legal to burn the flag. It should be legal to do all sorts of different things and have a conversation. So it's really a segment of the quote unquote left that's really supporting the cancel culture. And you mentioned how they say you're not being canceled. Um, you're just being criticized. Well, that's actually what Trump says as well. He's criticizing the press. He's criticizing other people on the right to do things. And, they, and he says some things that are pretty outlandish. And then people on the left go, oh, that's awful. He's against free speech. He's against freedom of the press. Um, and frankly, both sides are doing the same thing. They're trying to cancel each other out. They're trying to only be heard and make it socially unacceptable to have a different idea. Now, right, it's getting more a severe difference? when you lose your job. Exactly. Um, is how we're going to go to Well, say I was going to say, you mentioned the question of legality. Isn't there a difference between what's legal and, and what gets ink? Because, I mean, you can go out on the street and deny the Holocaust or call yep. for a return to slavery, uh, but most, almost all publications would say that that does not fall within the, the boundaries of reasonable de debate that's based on a society of democratic values. So Correct. it's also a question of, of boundaries, isn't it? And where you draw them and who gets to draw them. It is. And that's actually what um, Barry, um, Barry's resignation letter from New York Times is about. Um, when New York Times pulled down an op-ed an op by a senator who's like saying, you know what, law and order is important um, during this time of tearing down statues. And there was so much backlash from that, they pulled that down. And that was kind of a, I don't know, I, I begin to come up with this phrase of um, power coward. It's just like they had the power to do the right thing, but they had such mm. bad, which is to show the different points of view, but they had such a big backlash. And it's, and you gotta understand, to, to give press people a break, I mean, Nat, Nat was talking about the difficulties in the business model. Recognize in the last 15 years, there are half as many people in newsrooms in newspaper rooms as there were 15 years ago. Um, they have been slaughtered as an industry. Not, not the big ones, New York Times and TV, but others have been slaughtered. So there's this fear-based, we must hold on to our audience. And mm. in that fear-based mentality, they're kind of giving up their principles of journalism in order to don't upset our, our paying public too badly because we need them or don't upset our corporations. And I, I think they're wrong to do that. Because I think journalism is a noble cause. It's not just a profit-making cause. It's a noble one that our democracy requires to be done well. But at the same time, I don't go all gun-ho like a lot of people say, you should do this. I'm just saying, we're going to come up with a better system. So now hmm. and I are, are creating better systems to empower the people who realize the importance of debate. And that's where you get the answer. It's not so much that there are, there are a lot of people who it's not really that the whole world is separated from left and right. It's more that they're all the voices of reason or all the voices of compassion, all the normal people are being drowned out. And what we want to do is give them the power. We want to give yeah. people the power who actually do listen to each other and are actually focused on results as totally. opposed to just rhetoric. 
um, and let's give them the power to be heard and to have the ability to move and change policy, not just the extremes, not just the people manipulating us against each other to make money or to win votes. Let's give the, 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 the sane rest of the normal people, <laughs> um, the, the rational folks. Right, and that's definitely something we've other. found, we've found with, braver angels, with braver angels as well. And that's um, what braver angels does so well, is you always bring in somebody from both sides. So everybody's there is actually listening to both sides and they recognize that we're in this together solving a common problem. If you start there, amazing things can happen. If instead you get caught up in the politics and division of it where you're like, we're in a boat and those other people are in that other boat, that's when things break apart. But when we indeed, realize we're in the same boat, things get better. And I think that it's always empowering when you realize that understanding another perspective, even when you find abhorrent, does not preclude your ability to passionately advocate for what you believe in. It actually strengthens it. Exactly. Um, but so, Nat, I know it's a broad question, but I want to give you a chance, too, to weigh in on this whole uh, debate of cancel culture and safetyism and objectivity versus moral clarity. What do you think, just personally, when you've been reading the last uh, week of tweets and also how you think about it in terms of nowhere and what you guys are trying to do? Right. I, I, you know, it's a um, fascinating question. The, um, the reason free speech in the United States is, is protected to the extent it is, and the reason it isn't in so many other countries, um, is really about protecting debate. Debate is the core of finding ways to move forward as a society. Uh, it's the it's the it's the only way in which we can generate a more prosperous society for all um, uh, without marginalizing communities um, uh, in a fashion that historically has been has been done and continues to be done. Um, and you know the 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 way we think about it at nowhere is that we must hear every voice. We must hear every voice. There is uh, you know we um, uh, cannot shut out parts of the debate if we want to understand the fullest picture of the world we possibly can. And in our efforts to do that, that's how we can communicate that to our readers. And I think the, the, the three of us are all, or I, I think, on a pretty similar page about this, where there is a, um, there is a line um, that gets crossed. And I think it's the, I think it's the line when um, critique becomes kind of forces institutional closure or institutional retreat from those ideals of, of free debate and free speech. And, and that's where I think cancel culture, um, cancel culture, culture in quotation marks, is a, um, you know, becomes a toxic force. I think the open free debate and critique of whatever Barry Weiss might say and uh, whatever her detractors might say on Twitter is an important critical part of a democracy. When it is, uh, when it, when it goes to the New York Times retreating an op-ed on the basis of, of, of critique and actually you know, pulling back um, their contribution to democratic discussion or some you know, one individual's, the opinion piece, um, uh, contribution to democratic discussion. I think that is, is, is indicative of a dangerous shift. Um, uh, but I do think you know, the likes of um, Barry Weiss um, uh, uh, and a lot of the other folks who, for example, signed the letter that, um, uh, you know, criticizing council culture before Barry Weiss re resigned from the Times, um, uh, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those commentators, um, as John rightly said, thrive off of this and have built their audience and a lot of their careers off of this. Um, and so I think some of it is kind of, um, uh, I think some of the discussion is a little bit like, uh, is a little bit um, ironically self-victimizing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and so it, if you're going to be, if you're going to be a major, major proponent of free speech, then, uh, you should be defending your opponent's, uh, right to critique you. Um, and you know, that is, I think something that, um, the kind of pushback against council culture, uh, it, you know, has an, uh, has an issue with, um, the flip side of that is, um, you know, mob rule is, uh, you know the 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 great fear of what mm -hmm. democracy can can descend into, and so I think there's a this is where I think we have a responsibility as news organizations 
uh, as informers of the public debate um, to help drive empathy and help drive, you know, we, we have to be striving for a shared reality. Um, if we are not, how on earth can we expect those two parties to have a conversation? And I think the main consumption channels and the news organizations that are so widely consumed on those, on those channels um, have basically over the last 20 years, in, I think in the, technology case, in the technology companies' cases, there is um, significantly more blame to shoulder. I think a lot more of the, the, on the news organization side, I think a lot more of it is actually driven by the economics and the, the destruction of, of, of the business models that previously sustained those organizations and this kind of forced people back into camps. Um, I think, uh, you know, when we have that paradigm, um, you know, the organizations that the three of us are, are, are building is about uh, laying a different foundation for, for, for the national conversation and the global conversation and the local one, um, uh, certainly, in, you know, in the case of our Tragic Coast Bureau. And, uh, you know, that is, I think, a shift in ideals needs to take place from where we've been the last 20 years. Um, uh, you know, there, there, there's, there's no easy, straightforward solution to this. Um, uh, but I do think as, as news media organizations, as uh, nonprofits uh, uh, working in the space of communication across partisan lines, you know, we uh, have a responsibility to build and scale these organizations. And I actually think about um, taking our, our companies to scale, for me, is about the opportunity to recalibrate a lot of that, that kind of um, cultural dislocation. Um, right. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I think it, it, it's certainly a driving force in part of how we think about the value of our, of our work. And from a values perspective, you know, not hiding. It's actually one of, one of our values as a company is to not hide. And that includes not hiding from ideas, not hiding from the other, you know, from the, the, the different, not hiding from the things you find distasteful. But understanding that in order for people to best understand the world, we have to go through the process of reason and debate in critiquing each other if we're going to get a better understanding. So I think there's a, there's a lot of hyperbole on either side. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think the three of us are doing the right thing and getting on with building organizations to set a different tone. Um, because uh, lo and behold, the ones that uh, 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 at the core of the conversation today are not. Totally. And I think what you just said speaks a lot to what Braver Angels has been emphasizing, particularly with our name change, is, is courage. You know, it, empathy, respect, compassion are all necessary, but doing this work takes courage, not just to, you know, absorb the insults that you're going to get from people you disagree with, but also withstand the judgment that you're going to get from people who are on your own side, who are going to, you know, criticize you of being an enabler or apologist or a both sidesist or what have you. Um, but Nat, you mentioned business models, and uh, this takes me to sort of the last question I, I wanted to ask you, and I'll go to you first, John, and then Nat give you the last word. But I think a lot of this does come down to the economic question and the question of profit incentives. Uh, and it's a thorny one, and one that you guys are both um, navigating. How can we incentivize nuance, incentivize intellectual humility, versus conflict because let's be honest you know a tweet that is a snarky dunk on someone is going to get a lot more retweets than you know a carefully considered reasonable argument that kind of looks at the merits of both sides um so it's tough and and john how do you think about that how do you make money off this how do you scale it how do you create those incentives that challenge what are very core uh, dopamine-driven, conflictual appetites. It's actually much easier today than it was when we started eight years ago. Um, eight years ago, that was actually one of our core goals, is to create a business model that rewards good behavior. And in our case, we started by doing a lot in schools and mm. a lot in education and also a lot with nonprofit organizations who required that kind of balance and integrity. And we, made, and we were servicing them, they were paying us to do some of that work to the extent that our name and our business model so tied into that principle that if we abandoned that ourselves, we would be financially disadvantaged. But now there is a pushback. In society in the last few years, there's a pushback against the extreme drone 
um, follow like zombies, angry mobs. And there was actually a huge group, all sites itself. I and mean, we've been around for a while. We've been doing pretty well. We've been doing quite well. But in the last, ten year, in the last year, our audience has grown by 10 times. We've been growing by 30% every month on average for the last 12 months in a row. There is this big shift in society. And Barry Weiss's, um, as well as that letter he talked, well, she talks about there's a now a thirst out there for something better. And the best way to understand it, I think, is this. If you built a restaurant based on the business model that the internet drives for journalism on impulse purchases, your restaurant would have nothing but Cheetos and Mountain Dew. And I like Cheetos and Mountain Dew. We talked before we started how much I like Mountain Dew. Um, but if that's all you eat, you end up with a stomachache. You feel sick. And that is people's experience with journalism today. They've been having junk food and it gets your attention immediately. And all the dials in terms of the way that business people look at internet click-throughs work better for a bunch of junk food. And that will help you in the short term, but eventually they don't trust you anymore. And the fact that Gallup and Pew show that our trust levels, people's trust in news is lower than it's ever been. It's actually slightly higher than it was just before Trump got elected, um, but it is historically low. I know of no industry that survives with as low credibility as the news media industry has, other than politicians. Um, I know no news or uh, any industry that can survive that well. And so eventually people are going to go to another restaurant. It's our job, the people, Nat's job, my job, your job, Karen, is to give people who want a better meal. It doesn't have to be health food, yicky stuff. It could be really robust mm. um, food that you enjoy eating and it actually makes you a stronger person at the end. That's what good journalism and news can do. But in their desperation, and short-sightedness over the little bleeps and measures on internet traffic tracking, they've kind of gone to the junk food world. So all you can get is a bunch of Twinkies and Cheetos and Mountain Dew, and I love all those. I haven't had a Twinkie for a while, but Cheetos and Mountain Dew I've had. Um, but we can do better and people want better. And mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity. So if you think about alcoholics, they have to really, you kind of want them to get really bad so that they recognize, you want them to kind of fall off the cliff. You want to get so bad that they recognize there's a problem and they change what they do. Right now, society is seeing how bad it can be. And I'm hoping we're bottoming out and that people are waking up saying, this is awful, this is terrible for society, it's terrible for me, it's making me stressed and, and irritated and angry at people who are perfectly normal people. Um, Hopefully, this is the eye-opening moment that will drive us to change and that we can actually start eating better journalism. Hmm. I love the culinary metaphor and I think you've inspired me to have a lunch after this of lean protein and leafy greens. Um, <laughs> Nat, same, same question to you. I'll give you the, the last word because I know you're also trying to, to run and grow and scale a business. How do you think about this profit incentive question? Yeah, a marvelous analogy, John. Um, uh, it's, it's so funny because that actually takes me back to our very earliest fundraising, um, you know, when we were raising our first capital to get going uh, four or so years ago, um, uh, just as we were getting started. And um, that was the, one of the exact analogies I used when people asked me, well, do people really want honest, good, structured, thoughtful uh, reporting? Do people actually want that? And I said, well, look, I, I believe, we believe fundamentally they do, but actually that is not divorced from the profit incentive in the long run. And what we, what we, what we have fallen into is exactly as you say, John, where the, the, the news media ecosystem is so focused on the short, it's short run survival that it has to play for the short wins. Um, and in the short run, absolutely, getting a click or two, getting another piece of, of, you know, of information that drives conflict and uh, uh, vitriol online may bring traffic in the short run. But what happens, you see that decline of trust over time. And you know, this is one of the reasons why um, for us, local is so central. Because especially when you look at local reporting, what is actually the profit driver in the long run? The profit driver is building trust 
with the communities you serve and is is reporting to people about the things that really matter to them the the the, the school board the changes in their tax situation you know the 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 changes in their, their local restaurants, what, what happened at their kid's school yesterday. You know, those things that are, that are really a part of our everyday lives um, uh, have been kind of somewhat thrown out by the news business as, as a viable opportunity. And that's why we've done, you know, we're doing the work we, we have been and continue to on the production side. Um, but it, you, we really see that as the, 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 the path to rebuilding trust in a great american news media company um and you know that is um you know i I really believe and it's actually one of the things that we again talk about within our values as a company um is the um profit and uh reporting the facts in a way that can be trusted by all in a way that values and is decent um uh, in, uh, you know, decent and tolerant of the many different perspectives and values that people bring to the table and the way the lenses through which they look at the world. Um, uh, we believe that in the long run, that's what's going to drive uh, value for us. Uh, the, the, the true economic value comes on the other side of true social value. And, and, and uh, you know, if you're as if you want to build a company that has generational value, I believe that's the headspace you have to be in. If, if, if you're happy with a quick buck, um, which I think, you know, Facebook and Google and a number of others have made a great quick buck the last 20, the, the last 20, 15, 20 years. Um, but, you know, it's our job to eat some of their lunch. And that's the, that's the only way in which we're going to uh, shift our, our narrative. But I think the, the other point you touched on, John, is the hunger for this. I got an email just this morning from a reader um, saying, you know, this is some of the best reporting I've read in a very long time. Thank you for being a beacon of light, um, mm. uh, you know, amidst this, this vitriol. And I think people are tired of that vitriol. Um, we see it every we see it every single day, um, and I, I think that is demonstrative of the fact that the pendulum shifts, uh, the pendulum swings, and uh, in the long run, people will turn to the information that helps them and their families and their communities lead better lives. Uh, you know, not lives that create where you've got more stress being created for you, where you're less able to determine what your tax situation is, where you've got a worse understanding of your, your, the, your school infrastructures, where you've got a worse understanding of how federal policy might impact you. In the short run, that might be, might be all well and good. In the long run, that's not going to help people lead better lives. And that's what we need to do as news organizations. Yeah, to support Nat, he's 100% right. But there's also a point, a business point, that the sources that polarize that do the junk food that's saturated that's commodity news everybody does that um if you're looking to make money doing that a little better than somebody else when they have all this that's going to be hard there are piles of people there there aren't enough people delivering good journalism now that's actually where the opportunity is so if you're just taking off your social good hat which is driving me a great deal and look at the business opportunity the business opportunity is in delivering high quality content and journalism that's where the opportunity is and it's where society needs us to go for a healthier democratic system totally well i think that's a good note to end on it's it's optimistic it's ambitious it's courageous and you know we find the same thing at braver angels this is a generational challenge and yes we're in an election cycle and yes it's a contest it should be people should fight hard but are we going to have the country we want the day after the election, regardless of who wins? This is this is a long-term project, and we found the same appetite. And so I guess for all three of us, it's a question of um, keeping it going, keeping it growing, keeping it scaling, and uh, trying not to spend too much time on Twitter as well. So with that, I will uh, thank you both, uh, John Gable and Nathaniel Barling. I encourage all of our listeners to check out your organizations, All Sides and Nowhere News. Follow them on social media, sign up for their email list, and hopefully have you guys back on at some point uh, later in the year or next year. So thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you very much for hosting. That was great.